nighttime vamps. It was in early summer, me and my friends, Abby Carter, P. Skillet, and Tonda Jones all went out to a camp in a nearby national forest to drink hooch and smoke pseudo-legal recreational marijuana. We all got in Abby's car. Well, technically, it was Abby's mom's car, and it was also uninsured. So we drove out after 9 p.m. when there wasn't much traffic, and Abby drove carefully because we weren't sure what would be worse to get caught with, the no insurance or the box full of jars of bootleg moonshine and bags of unlicensed weed. And we were resolved not to find out, especially considering both the unexistence and existence, respectively, of the above. Anyway, we got to the campsite around midnight, and we saw that there were two big tents already set up. So we set up our four one-person tents around the campfire, far from the camps that were already set. Skillet had brought a pile of chopped wood wrapped in plastic. I unpacked the wood and built a fire while Skillet rolled up some reefers. Toss me a light, Dagman, he politely requested. Kind of using it. Can you hold on? I groused as I continued lighting the campfire. Once it was going, I nonchalantly chucked the lighter over my shoulder and it hit Skillet right in the Ray-Bans. Not cool, dude, he admonished. Right. Watch how you throw that thing, Twanda added. It's my lighter. I decided how to throw it, I proclaimed rudely as I found a seat on one of the fireside benches. Abby was just getting back from the car around then. Are you guys behaving out here? She asked with a genuine concern. Oh, we're behaving all right, P. Skillet began ironically. Behaving like animals, he finished sincerely. Are you throwing things again, Dagger? She asked, looking across at me with an exaggerated crossness that had to be in jest. No more than usual, Carter, I said with a shrug. That wasn't an understatement either. Objects did have a tendency to leap out of my hands, especially where Skillet was involved. I'd like to say he brought it out of me, but it probably had more to do with my issues than his. All right, guys, this is the northern lights from my Uncle Dave's farm, P. Skillet announced as he toked up the slender dube. I thought to myself, if they'd let me roll, we'd have a much fatter joint. Then, of course, that voice in the back of my head reminded me that if they let me roll, I'd still only be about halfway through. We started observing the sacred tradition of Puff Puff Pass, and somehow one of the jars of moonshine made its way into the rotation, almost like a chaser for the joint. As the hours drew on, my friends and I remained awake around the fire talking loudly and carrying on as we consumed a preponderance of shine and weed. Around 3 a.m., Tawanda set up her stereo and put on an EP of some traditional African dance music and began going through her routine. Skillet enjoyed watching her move. I liked this situation because it gave me an excuse to sit closer to Abby. Not that that proximity would grant me the courage to make a move. But when Tawanda was about halfway through her routine, our fun night of substance binging was interrupted as an old man emerged from the closer of the two other tents. Can you youngsters quiet down that jungle music? He shouted at what seemed like an unnecessarily loud volume. Use earplugs, Tawanda shouted back, continuing to gyrate. And put a damper on those legs you're sawing. This is bullcrap, the old man veritably screamed. Shut it down, right now! Suddenly, there was a stirring in the farther tent. Then, with an unexpected suddenness, a group of dark-skinned men in leaning robes surrounded the old man. And just as suddenly, the color drained from their skin and hair. Their features became elongated and grotesque. Notably, their teeth stretched into conical serrated blades, as did their fingernails. They tore into the old man and feasted on his flesh, less than fifty yards from us. They transformed into nighttime vamps, P. Skillet stated, with a surety that 
alone exceeded the absurdity of the phrase, which, under the circumstances, those of the strangers having undergone a frightening metamorphosis before our eyes and brutally slaughtered the other camper, probably contributed to that name sticking in our minds. Oh, hell no, Tawanda exclaimed. We effing out of here. As we all started running to the car, Abby tripped and lurched toward me, grabbing me about the midsection. I may have drank too much to drive, she said. You're a big guy, Dagger. Think you can take the tiller? Sure thing, Carter, I said with a confidence I didn't feel, as I tried to pull her along without slowing too much. Wait, the stuff, Skillet said, almost turning around to go back for his box of herbs and hooch. Just leave it, Tawanda roared, grabbing him by the hand and dragging him. If we're not going back for my stereo, we're sure not going back for that stuff. It definitely would not have been a good idea to turn back for anything. By the time we were in the car, with the doors shut, they were all around us. Abby jammed the key in and started the ignition from the passenger seat as I took the wheel and nearly flooded the engine before we took off, leaving a wake of smoke and dust for the distorted humanoids to choke on. I've seen many horrors since, but none have rattled me more than the chance encounter with the so-called nighttime vamps. So, before you decide to go camping, remember to respect other people's space and avoid unnecessary noise pollution, because you never know when that unassuming dome tent across from you may be housing a brood of nighttime vamps. Another lesson to take away from this is never to drink and drive, because on the highway, on the way back to town, we were involved in a head-on collision with a police vehicle in which I fractured eight ribs from colliding with the steering wheel. Skillet suffered a lumbar separation and spent the rest of his life as a paraplegic. Tawanda dislocated her right hip, an injury she blames for her failure to start a professional dancing career. And Abby received severe facial scarring from being pelted in the face with a cascade of shattering glass. The police officers both had functional airbags, which successfully deployed. However, they both complained of neck pain, and collection agencies continue to harass Abby's mom to this day, demanding recompense for the officer's medical bills. My medical treatment occurred in a prison infirmary. I was let off with time served after a couple months. Not really enough to heal, but more time than the state was willing to pay for, apparently. I remember someone in the ward I was in continually shouting about nighttime vamps. I'm not entirely convinced it wasn't me, though it sounded far away. <laughs>